Welcome everyone to another Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News webinar. Our presentation today is entitled Turning Up the Volume on Cell Therapy Production. I'm Jeff Bogoliskis, Technical Editor for GEN, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar presentation. The complex biology of cells has hindered the direct translation of analytical scale experiments into commercial manufacturing processes that are efficient and cost effective for generating cell-based therapies. With cell-based therapeutics poised to ignite a revolution in biomedicine, investigators are searching for workflow solutions that will streamline bioprocessing challenges. Let's meet our speakers for this GEN webinar who will address the manufacturing obstacles that many researchers face as they begin to scale out and scale up biotherapy production. Kate Strathern is a bioprocess sales specialist at Corning Life Sciences. Dr. Strathern will introduce us to some of the challenges that face investigators during upstream manufacturing processes, as well as tell us how Corning is addressing these manufacturing woes with new innovative technology. Alan Moore is a VP and Commercial Chief for Biologics and Advanced Therapies at Wuxi Aptech. Mr. Moore will inform us how Wuxi Aptech is undertaking some of the challenges faced when producing advanced cell therapy compounds. Before we get started with Kate's presentation, I want to encourage everyone to submit questions for our Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can, so simply type your question in the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen and hit submit. All right, without any further ado, let's get our webinar underway. Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff, for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar on turning up the volume on cell and gene therapy. As Jeff mentioned, my name is Kate Strathern, and I'm the Corning Bioprocess Specialist Manager. Today I'm going to give you a quick introduction into the challenges that many companies are facing today in upstream manufacturing. I'm also going to discuss some innovative technologies from Corning that help address some of these issues. And finally, I'm going to then hand the presentation over to Alan, who will discuss how Wuxi Aptech addresses these challenges in their manufacturing process. So what are the challenges facing the industry today? Well, as many of you know, one of the major problems is developing a platform that is robust enough for cell expansion, whether it be for autologous and or allogenetic therapies. Some of the obstacles that need to be addressed include whether or not the process can be offered as a closed system. As many of you are aware, the more open a system is, the higher the contamination risk. The availability of the raw materials. Some of these raw materials include the vessels used for cell expansion, as well as the various media components, such as growth factors, cytokines, and or serum. And lastly, what is the expansion process? Can it be scalable? Is real-time monitoring needed or an option? How long is the processing time for seeding, media exchanges, and collecting either the cells or the product secreted in the media? And how is the cell recovery? These are all important questions to ask when selecting a platform. To address some of these challenges in upstream manufacturing, Corning has developed many innovative technologies. For example, as researchers are looking to expand their cells in the cell therapy industry, Corning will be launching a new dissolvable microcarrier later this year. This platform will be scalable and will help improve process time, for once you've expanded the cells, you are then able to dissolve the microcarrier for easy separation. Additionally, for all of our products, such as cell stacks and Erlenmeyer's, we offer closed system accessories either off the shelf or customized to your process. For example, the closed system Erlenmeyer's can be tube welded to our rocker bags or cell expansion bags to allow for a continuous closed system during expansion. However, one of the products I wanted to discuss in more detail, and one that you will see again in Alan's presentation, involves another one of Corning's innovative technologies, the HyperStack. As many of you know, traditional technology involves gases such as oxygen diffusing through the vent cap through the headspace and medium, and interacting with the cells. However, with the hypertechnology, the polystyrene that your cells are cultured on is much thinner. It's so thin that the gas exchange occurs directly through the plastic, eliminating the need for the vent cap and headspace. 
As a result, according to Ben Stack, multiple stackets on top of each other leave in a small tracheal space in between each layer. The gases then enter through the tracheal space, diffuse through the polystyrene, and interact with the cells. Each stackette is connected by the manifolds, which you will see depicted on the next slide. The manifolds allow for the media and air to enter or leave the vessel. This innovative hypertechnology allows researchers to culture more cells without requiring more space. To increase throughput for those in manufacturing, Corning applies the hypertechnology to the footprint of the cell stack to develop the hyperstack. The manifolds that I mentioned previously are depicted in both of these images. As you can see, there are two tubing sets that connect to the vessel through these manifolds. The first tubing set has a vent filter attached to allow for air to sterilely enter and or leave the vessel. And the second tubing set is the liquid line, allowing for the media and reagents to enter and leave the vessel. The hyperstack is offered as two options. The hyperstack 12, which is 6,000 centimeters squared and roughly the size of a two-layer cell stack, or the hyperstack 36, which is 18,000 centimeters squared and roughly the size of a 10-layer cell stack. Lastly, the product is offered as a closed system that can be customized to better fit your process. The added advantage of the hyperstacks would be the ability to manifold multiple vessels together to improve process time. Here I have an example of four hyperstack 36s connected to a single 20-liter corning bag filled with media. The total growth area depicted here is 72,000 centimeters squared and is enough to culture anywhere from 4 to 12 billion cells depending on your cell type. As Alan will discuss on his slides, these manifolded hyperstacks can then be used in clinical manufacturing for cell and vector production. So in summary, there are many platforms that are available for scaling up either adherence or suspension-based cells. These platforms are customizable based on your needs and application. And Corning does offer a complete solution ranging from the closed system vessels to the surfaces and flexible packaging, and finally the media. So without further ado, I want to pass the presentation along to Alan. Alan, it's all yours. So before we jump to Alan's presentation, I want to thank Kate for a great introduction into cell therapeutic manufacturing challenges, as well as remind everyone to submit questions for our Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can, so simply type your question in the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen and then hit submit. Okay, with that said, let's move on to our next presentation. Alan, the audience is looking forward to what you have to say. All right, thanks, Jeff. Thanks very much, Kate. Appreciate the opportunity to present today. Uh, we've had a really productive relationship with Corning over the years, and uh, I can attest that uh, Corning has been very helpful in uh, helping us develop platforms to support uh, the advanced therapy manufacturing here in Philadelphia. My challenge today is to describe some of the uh, challenges that we're addressing in uh, the production of uh, advanced therapeutics. Uh, I have the uh, opportunity to give you a brief introduction to Wuxi Aptech. Uh, Wuxi is not exactly a household name in the context of advanced therapies, so I do want to spend a little time and let you know what we built and uh, how we're supporting the industry. I also want to touch on the facilities uh, requirements uh, that are being uh, mandated for the production of, of cell manufacturing and gene therapy vector manufacturing. Uh, some of the challenges in maintaining the chain of identity uh, the scheduling and logistics, which uh, can be daunting for autologous gene therapies. Uh, the quality control paradigms, which we're using uh, to ensure that these products uh, meet the quality specifications uh, and are delivered to the patients in a timely fashion. Uh, the process of development and optimization efforts, which are required uh, in order to uh, move these products to late stage production uh, and to provide uh, optimized manufacturing processes uh, so important for uh, the delivery of these products. And also uh, touch briefly on the types of manufacturing partnerships that are evolving in this space. 
I'll start with Wuxi. Uh, Wuxi was founded in 2001 and has grown very quickly uh, to encompass more than 14,000 employees worldwide. Um, the facilities uh, are in, in various uh, countries from China, uh, the US, uh, Israel, even uh, Iceland, where Nextcode Genomics reside, uh, and recently opened facilities in Japan. The company uh, encompasses more than 5 million square feet of existing uh, R&D and manufacturing uh, space, and there are uh, 26 R&D and manufacturing sites or laboratories and offices worldwide. Wuxi has invested heavily in cell and gene therapy manufacturing, and it has become one of the uh, company's central pillars of or platforms to provision of services. Other services include biologics, R&D, manufacturing, small molecule discovery and manufacturing services, uh, the provision of an array of medical device uh, testing services, and most recently, genomics and molecular diagnostic uh, programs, which are based in the Shanghai facilities. The company supports uh, a broad array of client companies. Uh, partners include multinational pharma companies, as well as small, innovative, uh, uh, in small, innovative companies. For cell and gene therapy, uh, Wuxi is offering an integra integrated set of manufacturing and testing services, and has a history now of collaborations on breakthrough. Uh, product manufacturing and new technologies. Uh, some of these include CAR-T and novel cancer immunotherapies. We've also established collaborations on adeno-associated uh, viral vector manufacturing platforms and analytical tools. Uh, AAV is a very common viral vector employed in gene therapy studies. We're providing uh, contract development and manufacturing expertise from development uh, through commercialization. Our, our most advanced production has included phase three manufacturing of cell therapies. We uh, have recently uh, brought online new facilities in the Philadelphia Navy Yard, which include a 55,000 square foot facility for com commercial scale manufacturing of autologous and allogeneic cell therapies, as well as a 150,000 square foot facility for gene-mediated cell therapies and viral vector manufacturing. Our initial uh, facility in the Philadelphia Navy Yard was an 80,000 square foot facility designed for biomanufacturing as well as quality control and process development services. This came online in 2004 and Wuxi's history of cell therapy manufacturing goes all the way back to 2004. As programs matured uh, and graduated to late stage clinical manufacturing, it became apparent that we needed specialized facilities for these autologous and allogeneic cell therapies. So we broke ground about a mile away from our existing facility on a 55,000 square foot site which is designed to meet U.S. and EU requirements for manufacturing of cellular therapies. As this facility was under construction, our management committed us to the production of gene-mediated cell therapies, uh, and this was uh, in line with the excitement around CAR T cell therapies. So uh, we designed and built a 150,000 square foot facility in, and occupied that facility last year. The facility itself is now uh, producing uh, CAR-T products under GMP. Regulatory agencies have uh, very clear guidance as to the qualification and the construction of facilities that are employing aseptic processing for cell and gene therapies. There is an expectation that the facility is uh, adequate to meet the requirements of housing the, the appropriate equipment and the appropriate uh, cleaning of those materials. 
aseptic processing requirements, which are most stringent uh, in the EU regulations, are employed, and closed systems and disposables are employed whenever possible. Wuxi decided that uh, we would build all of the new facilities in line with the most stringent requirements, and those are uh, the EMA requirements for aseptic processing. So each of the new facilities is designed to meet U.S. and EU compliant manufacturing standards. There are a uh, broad array of product types uh, which fall under the cell therapy mantle. I'm going to uh, use the example of an autologous CAR-T product today uh, to describe some of the activities underway here in Philadelphia. Um, CAR-Ts are uh, uh, part of the universe of cellular therapies and have very specific requirements um, based on the transduction of those cells. And it is uh, clear that each of these different type of cell therapies requires specialized facilities and specialized processes. Uh, for instance, uh, a stem cell which is being driven to a pancreatic islet cell uh, with a complex series of growth factors uh, is, uh, represents a very complex manufacturing process demanding tight controls and individualized quality control and in-process tests along the way. As we consider facilities and processes, uh, we have to reflect the nature of the product itself. Uh, we're dealing predominantly with allogeneic or off-the-shelf cell therapies and autologous cell therapies. Each has their own challenges and advantages. The uh, allogeneic cell therapies have the benefit of initiating production from a well-characterized master or working cell bank and providing a large number of doses uh, based on the original or starting materials. Uh, the characterization means that, uh, in some cases, less testing is required on the cell immediately prior to its release. Autologous products, uh, while more complex uh, and more, more related to consumption of the donor material, uh, do offer some advantages. And most recently, Dr. Steven Rosenberg has indicated that, in his view, uh, we will be moving to extensively customized individual patient therapies going forward. So Wuxi has decided that we need to be in a position to support both of these types of products and are doing so through these specialized facilities. Another consideration for autologous products is that often Limited material is available uh, for uh, characterization and uh, testing. Therefore, uh, innovative testing methods must be employed and rapid testing is often required to release these products back to the patient. Uh, CAR-T products are referred to as gene-mediated cell therapies. And this term can also be applied to uh, cellular therapies that employ gene editing. Uh, the following cartoon shows the common uh, processing steps which may be applied for either an autologous or an allogeneic uh, cell. Uh, the cells are collected, uh, selected by various mechanisms, expanded, harvested, and then delivered to the patient. So whether it's from a healthy donor or from a genetically engineered cell bank, uh, many of the processes are similar. When we were initially faced with the challenge of uh, manufacturing CAR T cell products, uh, we had to come to grips with uh, some of the realities of the process. Uh, we needed to be capable of handling lentiviral or retroviral uh, vectors apart from areas that were used for the manufacture of non gene mediated cell therapies. Uh, we needed to provide the segregation and chain of identity that is so important for autologous uh, patient processing or the production of uh, multiple products simultaneously. And we were in the position that uh, our manufacturing could well be gated by the ability to uh, uh, have vector 
available for transduction of the cells and, and therefore would gate the manufacture and release of products that were going to be used to treat patients. And it was this, uh, it was this last uh, component uh, which drove uh, Wuxi to make a decision to move into GMP vector manufacturing as well. In order to uh, have the greatest throughput and the smallest uh, footprint of expensive manufacturing suite space, uh, we developed a mechanism whereby multiple workstations uh, were set up within an aseptic processing core to allow for the concurrent processing of multiple patient materials. Uh, this cartoon here shows uh, a suite which includes four separate workstations and there is uh, shared equipment, uh, which is of course a necessity given the expense of some of the equipment, uh, that is utilized uh, for each of the individual patient materials being processed. This obviously uh, takes a great deal of discipline and training of the operators to ensure that there is adequate segregation and there is temporal segregation and changeover uh, when required for shared workspace. Regulatory agencies have the expectation that extensive control measures will be put in place to ensure that donor material, once processed, is returned to the donor. Uh, and it would be very critical for uh, material from one patient to be mislabeled and given to another patient. So Wuxi has set up a series of controls and a chain of identity program which incorporates individual components uh, that are, are detailed and uh, developed in cooperation with the client company and in some instances the clinical uh, site of collection. These include uh, labeling, label control, uh, the quality control samples, the use of barcodes, uh, and as well as uh, the labeling uh, and placarding of workspaces, uh, signage and identification of materials that are assigned to individual patients, uh, in-process verification of the adequacy of in chain of identity measures as well as batch record verification and inspection, um, and the appropriate storage and transport of, of incoming materials and outgoing materials to ensure that their label uh, is appropriate and that they are going to the right donor. Uh, these uh, uh, chain of identity procedures allow for customization through the use of client operating procedures. For an individual program, uh, to address chain of identity, we assemble a core team which can include the client representatives and quality representatives uh, that include manufacturing, QA, uh, IT, and management. We evaluate the adequacy of the suite design and the labeling of specific dedicated equipment. Also, the timing of uh, bringing on additional suites is also considered as the number of patients in a given clinical study may increase over time. Uh, generation of documentation as to the COI and any gap analysis that is required is conducted uh, to develop mutually approved uh, processes. These are implemented in engineering runs and are in full implementation for GMP processing. Uh, training of manufacturing staff, but also support and logistics staff are included to ensure that uh, the appropriate measures are maintained. Uh, this slide demonstrates the uh, general process for the development of a CAR-T uh, product. Um, it should be noted that this can be fairly complex and includes both uh, variable and fixed intervals. And the reason that that is important is that uh, we need as a contract manufacturer to ensure that we have the appropriately uh, trained and available individuals uh, available for the various processing steps. When you begin to layer multiple uh, patient processing 
uh, occurring on a simultaneous fashion, uh, this can get very demanding. Uh, we have variability in the uh, receipt of incoming a freeze material, and on day zero, there is a freeze uh, step which is available so that uh, there can be a degree of flexibility in when the next stage of manufacturing occurs. Uh, the T cell activation, uh, the transduction, and expansion are predominantly set intervals. However, uh, cell harvest may be uh, variable in that uh, a number of cells uh, may not be reached in uh, uh, time to harvest and deliver to the patient, and the, the harvest needs to be delayed. Um, the pack out and quality control and release testing of uh, the product is also predominantly a set interval. And at the end of the day, uh, the entire process interval uh, must be accommodated in terms of uh, manufacturing operation. For autologous production, uh, one patient is equivalent to one GMP manufactured product. Uh, often we must be very responsive as there are short notice requests uh, driven by concerns as to patient health. Um, we have to be uh, cognizant of uh, resource availability, not just manufacturing operators, uh, but quality control and environmental monitoring staff. And we need to be able to accommodate the process variability within our facilities and with the equipment. Uh, this requires a good deal of capacity modeling, and our goal is to increase the throughput as much as possible while uh, making sure that there is not overlap, which could cause uh, concerns about segregation of individual patient products. In addition to uh, being complicated, uh, the CAR-T processing and autologous cell processing can be very demanding. Uh, these are long days, operators uh, spending hours in uh, full gown in the cell processing suites and oftentimes working with uh, equipment, which requires custom programs and a high level of training, uh, producing large batch records, upwards of uh, 400 pages, and accommodating multiple uh, phases of uh, operation. In addition to demands upon the manufacturing operations, there are also uh, demands upon logistics, procurement, and supply chain. Uh, many of these products include custom materials which have a short expiry. Uh, often, materials are in high demand given the uh, excitement in the field and the uh, run on certain components. Uh, cost containment is a concern. Uh, variable lead times must be accommodated. And the testing required for release of raw materials uh, must be in line with the demands for manufacturing operations. Many of these products have extensive uh, bills of material. In some cases, 50 or more uh, materials and components required to produce a single dose of an autologous product. And in some cases, uh, kitting of these materials or pairing with medical devices is required uh, to transport the materials back to the clinical site. This is a, a diagram of the logistical approach, uh, the supply chain management, uh, which has been built in order to accommodate for autologous production, as well as late stage and commercial manufacturing. In essence, uh, we have embedded uh, master planners uh, who cooperate with the project managers and the production managers in order to maintain uh, schedules, forecasts, and details as to uh, required materials uh, necessary to deliver the capacity uh, required. Um, having integrated testing is a specific advantage in this regard as it allows us uh, to coordinate raw material testing and, and release of these materials to uh, meet the clinical demand. In addition, uh, autologous uh, transduced gene-mediated products 
uh, must ensure uh, that uh, they meet biosafety standards. There are extensive uh, guidance provided by the regulatory agencies as to required testing for replication-competent lentivirus or replication-competent retrovirus uh, used uh, to transduce the cells. Uh, this includes testing of uh, the cells themselves and in, uh, in clinical application, uh, monitoring of patients for the potential of a replication event. A distinct advantage uh, that we enjoy at Wuxi is a mature quality control and uh, testing organization. Uh, this group has been performing uh, GLP and GMP compliant testing and supports worldwide release of approved commercial products, more than 40. Um, the cell and gene therapy products uh, benefit from GMP cell banking and characterization studies. Uh, extractables and leachables testing performed by our sister laboratories, um, and the routine stability and lot release testing uh, that is required for cell and gene therapies. Uh, virus and retrovirus testing, uh, specialized potency testing, uh, purity and residuals analysis uh, are all under one roof, which allows for coordination and ultimately more rapid advance of these materials uh, to the clinic. If one thinks about um, process optimization, uh, one has to consider the challenges associated with uh, the autologous and allogeneic products. Uh, these include uh, source variability. Uh, for uh, autologous products, patient-to-patient -patient var variability is a reality. Uh, and in some instances, for autologous products, homogeneity of the initial uh, cell types uh, can be challenging. Uh, often there is limited availability of source material to conduct uh, process development or optimization studies, and in many cases, uh, limited samples are available for testing and the qualification and validation of analytical methods. Early uh, clinical processes often uh, are uh, uh, not lending to uh, long-term stability analysis based on the scarcity of material. And uh, packaging, cryopreservation, uh, and distribution uh, processes have not always been uh, fully explored. So uh, it is difficult in many cases to establish critical product attributes and to develop uh, and validate uh, potency assays. Many of the advanced therapies that uh, we are manufacturing enjoy accelerated uh, regulatory pathways. Uh, often this means that uh, the early phase uh, studies and the processes which have been used to generate clinical data are carried all the way uh, to pivotal studies. Uh, with the goal of uh, obtaining regulatory approval in the most rapid fashion. However, uh, sustainable manufacturing processes for uh, commercial use must be developed, and uh, if possible, uh, components which can be addressed at the earliest point should be addressed. Uh, we found that it has been important for a two-tiered development uh, program to be available to clients. Uh, both an early development uh, cycle and a late development cycle uh, in order to ensure that commercial uh, readiness uh, can be delivered and to provide a reasonable cost of goods for materials. Um, most of our uh, clients understand the uh, importance of optimization of a commercial process. Uh, some choose to do this development in parallel with their clinical manufacturing. Others are looking to employ uh, optimization post-approval. One area which has been very helpful uh, to us as we close processes uh, and work to scale up uh, allergen allergenic cell therapies 
has been to employ the HyperStack platform. Uh, we have successfully implemented HyperStack production uh, using manifolded HS36 units in GMP manufacturing of phase three materials. Uh, we've also established a platform for vector manufacturing, which takes advantage of the HyperStack system. We're using uh, up to 60 HyperStacks uh, of the, 30, the 36 layer units to generate approximately 250 liters of viral vector uh, supernatants. Uh, we're employing the hyperstacks for the production of lentiviral vectors, AAV, and uh, adenoviral and HSV vectors. Um, this platform allows us to streamline production, allowing us to minim minimize non-conforming events. Uh, it is primarily a closed system which limits the potential for contamination. Uh, our uh, ability to, uh, to stockpile uh, these materials uh, permits us to, to reduce lead times, and uh, we've developed good consistency uh, from trained operators. Uh, we also have a suite of uh, assays uh, which are available to specifically support the Lenti, AAV, and adenoviral vector manufacturing. And our relationship uh, with Corning has been very positive. Uh, the technical application team uh, has worked with us over the years to, uh, uh, to make sure that this platform uh, works well for our clients. So many of the uh, complexities of advanced therapies uh, and the uh, complications uh, that are, are required to be addressed uh, present challenges to the traditional model of uh, a contract manufacturer. Uh, we found that advanced therapies simply do not fit the standard transactional uh, deal structure. And therefore, uh, we've established uh, manufacturing partnerships uh, that uh, do meet these, these uh, requirements. Uh, as mentioned, the regulatory pathways for many of these products uh, uh, are, are clear and uh, acceleration is uh, anticipated, whether that's fast track designation or breakthrough product designation. Uh, the net effect is that it compresses the window for the client company to contract uh, late stage manufacturing and the transition to commercial supply. Uh, concerns about uh, ensuring uh, capacity availability uh, occur much earlier for advanced therapies. Um, as well, uh, process development must occur in a compressed window. Often process development and analytical method development and qualification are gating GMP manufacturing. Um, and so in addition to having available facilities and flexible facilities which can uh, meet uh, uncertain forecasts for launch and market penetration, uh, we need to ensure that all of these available resources are available in parallel if our goal is to deliver the fastest possible time to uh, the clinic. So our strategy has been uh, to provide uh, strategic manufacturing partnerships which leverage access to clinical and commercial grade manufacturing facilities, flexibility in the scale of production, capability to support uh, platform programs uh, where suites may be utilized for multiple products and multiple indications, to reserve resources for parallel path uh, development of analytical and uh, processes, um, and the ability to leverage quality control systems and compliance. Our approach has been to uh, provide an open access platform uh, and to provide a dedicated suite model whereby the uh, client can be ensured that processing of patients as they are accrued is, uh, is not going to be impacted uh, by other programs. Uh, we have hired specifically uh, for programs uh, and uh, have committed 
uh, to ensure the resource availability to meet high throughput expectations. And a unique feature is that Wuxi has pre-positioned large-scale and commercial-ready uh, manufacturing facilities with modular expansion uh, and has not pressed clients uh, to carry the burden of that capital outlay and construction costs. And in dealing with these complexities uh, and the day-to-day the -day struggles that uh, have been overcome to provide these services uh, really is warranted. Uh, what we've seen uh, in the clinic with many of the adoptive in immunotherapies has been very exciting uh, clinical results. Uh, pictured here is uh, Emily Whitehead, uh, who was one of the first pediatric ALL patients treated at the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. And as you can see, she's holding a sign there. Take, this was taken a while back, um, four years cancer-free. Uh, there is uh, an Emma Whitehead uh, Foundation, and if you want to visit uh, the website, I'm sure that uh, they would appreciate a, a donation. And Emma has done a, a, a nice job, and her family has done a nice job in reaching out uh, to fellow patients and uh, sharing her experience of, uh, of the CAR T therapies. Lastly, I'd like to uh, uh, provide special thanks to the team uh, here at Wuxi that's been uh, supporting uh, the manufacturing of these innovative products. It includes the uh, manufacturing leads, the, the, the core team members, the quality logistics staff, really a cross-functional effort uh, to bring these manufacturing resources to bear. And also, uh, we wish to thank our, our client uh, manufacturing, quality control, quality assurance, logistics, procurement, and clinical and project management teams. Uh, it truly requires a great deal of, of coordination uh, and uh, teamwork in order to, uh, to meet these, uh, the production of these exciting advanced therapies. And I'd like to thank the audience uh, for tuning in today uh, and leave you with uh, the summary slide. Uh, I'm pleased to have had the opportunity to, uh, to reach out and describe a little bit of the efforts that are underway here in Philadelphia and look forward to uh, uh, answering uh, some questions that may be generated. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. That was a great talk. I think our audience now has a greater appreciation for the numerous challenges researchers face and the vast amount of work that goes into producing advanced immunotherapy compounds. Before we start the Q&A session, I want to let everyone know that this is their final chance to submit questions for our speakers, so hurry up and send them in now. We already have a bunch of really great questions that have come in, but I want to remind the audience to keep them coming. All right, so let's begin the Q&A. I see we already have a few questions that have come in, so we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Give us a few moments on our side to get everything straightened out, and we shall begin the Q&A presently. All right, everyone, uh, let's start the Q&A. We have a lot of questions, so let's try to get to as many of them as we can. Kate, the first question is for you. One of our audience members would ask if you could please walk through Corning's custom closed system process. Uh, what is needed, and how would they know if it's the right application for them? Yeah, not a problem. Um, so if you're interested in customizing uh, something with our closed systems, if you reach out to your Corning representative, um, they'll typically put you in touch with the bioprocess specialist. Um, they'll sit down with you and talk to you more about the des um, what you're trying to accomplish, what design you're looking for, and then from there we'll kind of put a, we'll put a drawing together um, based on what you need. Um, from there we'll send non-sterile uh, samples so you can really make sure that it looks the part and looks what you want, um, and then we go from there for setting it up as a part number. Okay, great. Thank you. Alan, question for you um, on the same sort of uh, topic. If someone's employing a closed system for processing, uh, why do you need expensive processing suites in your manufacturing facility? 
Well, that's a great question. We get it frequently, and I think uh, at some point in the future, uh, facilities uh, will be designed to limit the requirements for uh, aseptic processing areas. But uh, the, the challenge that we faced was making sure that we could incorporate the appropriate aseptic processing environment for a range of different uh, processes. Some processes uh, are not entirely closed, and uh, uh, companies that have generated clinical data may not wish to move to a different process uh, in early clinical studies. Uh, so we uh, take a conservative view, uh, limit the uh, potential for contamination, uh, and our in conservative interpretation of the regs is that uh, if there are open processing steps, we need to employ the most stringent uh, uh, processing environment. Um, as, I, as I said, uh, somewhere down the line, uh, the hopes are uh, that uh, automated processes would be employed and that uh, barrier technology can come to the come to the rescue and limit the amount of aseptic uh, processing footprint that's required uh, to, to uh, produce these materials. All righty. Thank you, Alan. Kate, another question for you. Uh, one of our audience members would like to know if you could describe how the cells are trypsinized in a hyperstack. Yeah, not a problem. Um, so the cells are commonly harvested from the hyperstacks. Um, while for culturing the cells, you need to fill the vessel to completion. Uh, so for the hyperstack 36, that's about 3.9 liters of medium. To harvest the cells, you only need about 600 mils is the recommended minimum of either trypsin or triple E or whatever your dissociation reagent is. Uh, once you fill the vessel with mils, then you would do the same kind of um, movements that you would in a, an, any other stacked vessel, such as a cell stack or a T-flask. All righty, thank you. Alan, another question for you. Uh, what are some of the regulatory challenges you're seeing as products advance from early to pivotal clinical studies? Oh, sure, that's a, a great question. Um, it falls into a, a number of different categories. Uh, in some cases, the, the regulations uh, are, are evolving, and they are um, general, in, in many cases, to accommodate a range of, of different products and processes. Um, so there's a good deal of interpretation that, that has to take place on the part of uh, on the part of the client uh, and, and to engage the regulatory agencies in making sure that they're uh, complying with the intent of the regulations. Um, another uh, another challenge is that there are an increasing number of guidance documents that are uh, being compiled by various groups, um, uh, such as the USP, uh, uh, the um, uh, compendial uh, groups that are uh, laying out suggested uh, procedures and processes, and in some cases there is divergence uh, between those recommendations and uh, the interpretation of the uh, regulatory agency uh, guidance documents. I think another uh, challenge that we're seeing is uh, folks trying to interpret how much is required when they enjoy a, um, uh, a regulatory accelerator, so to speak. Uh, um, the uh, Japanese uh, guidance uh, for uh, advanced therapy products encourages um, rapid uh, implementation of uh, the products in, into the marketplace, and it's not really clear uh, to, to many people. Uh, just what is required as they compare that approach to, uh, say, a more traditional approach in the U.S. where there's a phase three study and uh, the concepts of validation of uh, process and, and all of the analytical tools uh, are, are put in place uh, prior to that, uh, to that uh, um, PAI. So I, I think there are... Uh, clarifications which are going to evolve over the next couple of years as it relates to the, the regulations and a, a harmonization. Uh, but today there's a, there's a good deal of interpretation required. All righty. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Kate, we have another question for you. It's a follow-up to your first question in regard to customs corn and closed system process. Uh, the audience member would like to know, what is the lead time to obtain samples or prototypes? 
So typically, once the drawing is finalized, it takes about two weeks to get a non-sterile sample. And if you need a sterilized sample, it's usually about four weeks. All righty. Thank you, Kate. Alan, we have another question for you. Um, I don't want to ever ask, how many patient dosage, uh, dosages are there per allergenic donor? Uh, sure. And that's uh, um, it generally. I'm going to have to answer generally. Uh, there's a, a single dose. Um, when we're talking about the uh, CAR-T therapeutics, there is a, a, a reserve in some instances of material that may be used for, for a second dose. Right. Thank you, Alan. Kate, question for you. Um, on the hyperstack, is the cell harvesting uh, an easy, simple process? So it's a relatively simple process. Um, there is some optimization as you're going from a traditional technology, such as a T-flask, and you're moving into the hyper platform. But we have uh, field application scientists, as well as our bioprocess specialists, that can provide um, hands-on support and really help guide you through that process. So um, it helps make the transition a lot easier. All righty. Thank you, Kate. Alan, question for you. Uh, do you have access to serum-free suspension production of lenti or other vectors in GMP scale? Uh, sh sure. Uh, the um, uh, Lenti platform, uh, the suspension platform, is under development here uh, at Wuxi. We do have an inherent uh, platform that employs the hyperstacks and uh, produces uh, about 250 liters um, from a, a 60 hyperstack run. Uh, suspension. Uh, there have been uh, developments of uh, uh, suspension uh, processes which do not employ serum or animal uh, components in the media. Uh, our PD team is working on that as we speak, and uh, we're hoping to be able to bring that uh, to the market um, uh, in the first half of 2018. All righty. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Kate, another question, a couple questions for you. Uh, one of them about the hyperstack again. What is the membrane material in the hyperstack? So it's polystyrene. It's the same polystyrene that your cells are typically cultured on with a tea flask. It's just um, a lot thinner. All right. Thank you. Alan, a uh, question for you. Is it acceptable to use rapid testing methods so that we can release our cell therapy back uh, to the donors as soon as possible? Uh, many of the cell therapies, particularly those that don't have a cryopreservation step, are uh, undergo an interim release, uh, and rapid test methods have been employed in, in that context. I think perhaps the, the best example of the acceptability of rapid test methods is the um, uh, PCR uh, test for mycoplasma. Uh, we've seen cases where the regulatory agencies have uh, suggested that it is an acceptable alternative to the culture method uh, for mycoplasma detection. Uh, obviously, it's a lot shorter. Um, also, uh, technologies like the uh, BACT alert system are being employed in, in these cases. Um, I'm not certain if the uh, uh, sterility, uh, the, the culture sterility method uh, the CFR sterility method has been uh, waived in, in some instances. I think the, uh, uh, that test is still employed, but it is uh, obviously providing an answer after the, the cells are delivered back to the patient. Um, so there has been regulatory um, suggestion of uh, rapid test methods, and, and I think the regulatory agencies are being very pragmatic about uh, uh, trying to get the most information that they can and recognizing that uh, rapid methods may provide uh, good insight and good guidance. All right. Thank you, Alan. It looks like we have time for two more questions, one for Kate. Kate, back to the hyperstack, a popular questioning today. Uh, what is the sterilization method of choice for hyperstack and tubing? So the hyperstacks are triple bagged and gamma sterilized. All righty, thank you. And that you. includes the tubing. It's, um, it's gamma sterilized as a complete unit. All right, thank you. Alan, last question for you. Uh, in the future, it will be necessary to use, uh, will be necessary to use automation in order to reduce the cost of advanced therapies. Uh, what is Wuxi doing in this area? 
Well, I think the uh, one of the key things that we're doing is uh, making sure that we have flexibility going forward, both with our uh, our our process development teams, uh, our training, and and the facilities. Um, we're currently employing some of the automated process equipment that that is uh, has been uh, introduced for cell processing. Um, and the industry, the tool providers are doing a great job recognizing the, the migration is necessary to uh, automated uh, process steps and closed process steps. Um, from the facility standpoint, we've actually built into the facility design the concept that uh, areas may be employed as, as kind of beta testing uh, areas for an automated process. Um, we're, we're, we've not seen uh, a good deal of, of fully automated processing at this stage, um, but uh, our hopes are that uh, when the technology and, and the, uh, the processes are available, we'll be able to accommodate them within a, a GMP environment, and we'll have both the, uh, the engineering and the uh, manufacturing science and technology uh, folks aboard that that will allow for that to uh, to be um, productive. All right, thank you, Alan. And it looks like we have one last question for Kate. Uh, clarification on uh, note: uh, Do you use HyperStack only for vector production, or also car TP? So, at least from what I've seen in the field, um, the HyperStacks have been used for. Um, many different purposes, whether it be for cell banking or for um, vector production. I haven't seen it used for CAR-T production, um, but I've also seen it used for uh, stem cell expansion. All right, thank you. And a follow-up to that, uh, real quick, Kate, stay with us. Would you consider using a bioreactor instead of hyperstacks? So is this more for I guess my follow-up would be for suspension-based cells or switching from uh, adherent base to suspension-based cells or using microcarriers in the bioreactors for adherent base. Yeah, but, okay. <laughs> that's a, that's a little question. I'm not, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Well, you know what? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Alan, Alan, I, Alan, can you uh, answer this question? Sure. Yeah, I, I think uh, our our view has been that there is a requirement right now for for both routes of production. Um, one of the one of the interesting things about about advanced uh, therapies is that uh, there are small and large indications, orphan indications uh, where there are very few patients, and then large indications where uh, large scale bioreactor production would be required. Um, so I think it it does uh, make sense, and and we are are believers that we can use HyperStack to fulfill uh, early stage uh, production requirements, and uh, that uh, the the scale up to bioreactors uh, is also going to be necessary. All right, thank you guys. And with that, we've come to the end of our webinar. So I'd like to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived on our site at www.genengnews.com for up to a year. So if you've missed any parts of it or want to watch it again or would like to forward along to your friends and colleagues, uh, you can do that. I'd like to thank Kate and Alan again for their informative presentations, and I'd like to thank the audience for their attention and thoughtful questions. And a very special thanks to Corning for sponsoring this webinar. So hopefully we'll see you again at another Gen webinar in the near future. Goodbye for now.